the death wish of a narco-communist. Now that the new left has abandoned its earlier loose, flexible, non-ideological stance, two ideologies have been adopted as guiding theoretical positions by new leftists, Marxism-Stalinism and anarcho-communism. Marxism-Stalinism has unfortunately conquered SDS, but anarcho-communism has attracted many leftists who are looking for a way out of the bureaucratic and status tyranny that has marked the Stalinist road, and many libertarians who are looking for forms of action and for allies in such actions have become attracted by the an anarchist creed which seemingly upholds the voluntary way and calls for the abolition of the coercive state. It is fatal, however, to abandon loose sight of one's own principles in quest for allies in specific tactical actions. In narco-communism, both in its original bakunin kropotkin form and its current irrationalist and post-scarcity variant, it pulls apart from genuine libertarian principle. If there is one thing, for example, that anarcho-communism hates and rivals more than the state is its rights of private property. As a matter of fact, the major reason that anarcho-communists oppose the state is because they wrongly believe that it is the creator and protector of private property, and therefore the only route towards the abolition of property is by the destruction of the state apparatus. They totally fail to realize that the state has been the great enemy and invader of the rights of private property. Furthermore, scorning and detesting the free market, the profit and loss economy, private property, and material affluence, all of which are corollaries of each other, anarcho-communists wrongly identify anarchism with communal living, with tribal sharing, and with other aspects of the emerging drug, drug rock youth culture. The only good thing that one might say about anarcho-communism is that in contrast to Stalinism, its forms of communism would supposedly be voluntary. Presumably, no one would be forced to join the communes, and, the, and those who would continue to live individually and to engage in market activities would remain unmolested. Or would they? Anarcho-communists have always been extremely vague and cloudy about the lineaments of the proposed anarchist society of the future. Many of them have been propounding the profoundly anti-libertarian doctrine that the anarcho-communist revolution will have to confiscate and abolish all private property as to wean everyone from their psychological attachment to the property they own. Furthermore, it is hard to forget the fact that when Spanish anarchists, anarcho-communists of the Bukinen Kropotkin type took over large sections of Spain during the civil war of the 1930s. They confiscated and destroyed all money in their area and proclaimed de decreed the death penalty for the use of money. None of this can give one can give one confidence in the good voluntarist intentions of anarcho-communism. On all other grounds, anarcho-communism ranges from mischievous to absurd. Philosophically, this creed is an all-out assault on individuality and on reason, the individual's desire for private property, his drive to better himself, to specialize, to accumulate profits and income, are reveled by all branches of communism. Instead, everyone is supposed to live in communes, sharing all his meager possessions with his fellows, and each being careful not to advance beyond his communal brothers. At the root of all forms of communism, compulsory or voluntary, lies a profound of hatred of individual excellence, a denial of nature or intellectual superiority of some men over others, and a desire to tear down every individual to the level of a communal ant heap. In the name of a phony humanism, an irrational and profoundly anti-human egalitarianism is to rob every individual of a specific and precious humanity. Furthermore, anarcho-communism scorns reason, and, it, and, it, and its corollaries, long-range purpose, forethought, hard work, and individual achievement. Instead, it exalts irrational feelings, whim, and caprice, all this in the name of freedom. The freedom of a narco-communist has nothing to do with the genuine libertarian absence of interpersonal invasion or, mol or molestation. It is instead a freedom that means enslavement to unreason, to un unexamined with whim, and to childish caprice. Socially and philosophically, anarcho-communism is a misfortune. Economically, anarcho-communism is an absurdity. 
The anarcho-communist seeks to abolish money, prices, and employment, and proposes to conduct a modern economy purely by the automatic registry of needs in some central data bank. No one has the slightest understanding of economics can trivial with this theory for a single second. Fifty years ago, Ludwig von Mises exposed the total inalienability inability of a planned, moneyless economy to operate above the most primitive level, for he showed that market prices are indispensable for the rational allocation of all of our scarce resources, labor, land, and capital goods, to the fields and areas where they are the most desired by consumers and where they could operate with the greatest efficiency. The socialists conceded the correctness of Mises' challenge and set about in vain to find a way to have a rational market price system within the context of a socialist planned economy. The Russians, after trying, a, after trying an approach to their communist moneyless economy and their war communism shortly after the Bolshevik Revolution, reacted in horror as they saw the Russian economy heading to disaster. Even Stalin never tried to revive it, and since World War II, the Eastern European countries have had a total abandonment of this communist ideal and a rapid move towards free markets, a free price system, profit and loss tests, and a promotion of consumer affluence. It is, it is no accident that it is precisely the economists in the communist countries who led the rush away from communism, socialism, and central planning and towards free markets. It is no crime to be ignorant of economics, which is, after all, a specialized discipline and one that most people consider to be a dismal science. But it is totally irresponsible to have a loud and vicious opinion on economic subjects while remaining in the state of ignorance. Yet the sure... Yet this sort of aggressive ignorance is inherent in the creed of anarcho-communism. The same comment can be made on the widespread belief held by many new leftists and by all anarcho-communists that, no that there is no longer need to worry about economics or production because we are supposedly living in a post-scarcity world where such problems do not arise. But while our condition of scarcity is clearly superior to that of the caveman, we are still living in a world of persuasive economic scarcity. How will we know when the world has achieved post-scarcity? Simply, when all goods and services that we may want have become so super abundant that their prices have fallen to zero. In short, when we can, we can, when we can acquire all goods and services as in a garden of Eden, without effort, without work, without using any scarce resources. The anti-rational spirit of anarcho-communism has a bit, was expressed by Norman O. Brown, one of the girls of the new counterculture. The great economist von Mises tried to refute socialism by demonstrating that, in abolishing exchange, socialism made economic calculation, and hence economic rationality, impossible. But if von Mises is right, then what he discovered is not a refutation but a psychoanalytical justification of socialism. It is one of the sad ironies of contemporary intellectual life that the reply of socialist economics to von Mises' argument was to, was to attempt to show that socialism was not incompatible with rational economic calculation. That is to say that it could retain the inhuman principle of economizing. The fact that the abandonment of rationality and economics in behalf of freedom and whim will lead to the scraping of modern production and civilization and return us to barbarism does not phase our anarcho-communists and other proponents of the new counterculture. But what they do not seem to realize is that the result of this return to primitivism will be starvation and death for nearly all of mankind and a grinding, and a grinding substan substance for the ones remaining. If they have their way, they will find that it is difficult indeed to be jolly and unrepressed while starving to death. All this brings us to the wisdom of the great Spanish philosopher Orgeta y Gasset. In the disturbances caused by scarcity of food, the mob goes in search of bread, and the means it employs is to generally wreck the bakeries. This may serve as a symbol of the attitude adopted on a greater, more and more complicated scale by the masses of today towards civilization by which they are supported. Civilization is just not here. It is not self-supporting. It is artificial. If you want to make the use of the advantages of civilizations, but you are not prepared to concern yourself with, uphold with the upholding of civilization, you are done. In a thrice you find yourself left without civilization. Just a slip, 
and when you look, everything has vanished into air. The primitive forest appears in its jungle state, just as the curtains covering pure nature has been drawn back. The jungle is always primitive and vice versa. Ever, everything primitive is mere jungle.